good morning and happy Thanksgiving week. that 
really lived a life that um, all circumstances, that man was it. Uh, he was through a lot. But we're going to look at the New Testament and look at a person who doesn't even have a name. Uh, we're in the book of Luke, and specifically we're looking at chapter 7. And the circumstances surrounding this woman uh, has to do with Jesus having been invited to the home of a Pharisee. And in most cases, uh, a Pharisee uh, spending time with Jesus was more so to trip Jesus up. Uh, it wasn't because, hey Jesus, I think you've got a wealth of knowledge and I think I want to spend some time with you and get some of that. No, most of the time it was more antagonistic. And the circumstances around this show that the Pharisee didn't do a lot of the traditional things that a host would do for a guest in their house. Um, he did not greet him with a holy kiss, as we call it. Uh, in Jesus' time, when someone came into your home, you would kiss them on the cheek, or the, both cheeks. And then, because you spent most of your time walking, and most of your time wearing sandals, your feet got very, very dirty. And so, oftentimes, the guest would have their feet washed uh, through the host, uh, not necessarily the host doing it, but someone in his uh, household, a servant of a servant, um, doing that job. And in this case, Jesus was invited to this man's house, and none of that happened. They even go so far a lot of times to anoint the person's head with oil, and none of this happened. And it wasn't long after they reclined for dinner. And again, in New Testament times, you didn't sit at a table like we do. Uh, you, the table was low to the ground, and there was usually lots of pillows, and you reclined to eat. Could you imagine having Thanksgiving dinner that way? <laughs> I can't. Not with that plate all piled full of food, and you're trying to do all of this. And uh, but. They reclined on their side and their feet behind them. And so here's the circumstances that we find ourselves in. Jesus is in this Pharisee's home, and suddenly a woman comes in and begins to weep. And she is weeping so much that she's able to wash Jesus' feet. And she wipes his feet clean with her hair. Now, the, the Pharisee is probably aghast that Jesus is even allowing this person to touch him because the Pharisee knows this woman. Even though she doesn't have a name in the story, he knows her, and he knows her reputation. And she's a very sinful woman. Um, when we talk about sin, not uh, having gauges, uh, that sin is sin, but the Pharisee saw this woman as a very sinful woman. Many people believe she was probably a prostitute. And she knew that Jesus was in town, and she wanted to get to Jesus. She didn't even have to say anything to him. She just humbly got to his feet, and she brought this alabaster jar of perfume that probably was a year's wages who knows how she got her wages, but <laughs> she had the perfume, and she broke this alabaster jar, and she poured this perfume on his feet and over his head. And she weeped. Now we talk about the sinful woman, and what does she have to be thankful for? Well, Jesus uses a story, because, of course, the Pharisee points out to him, this woman is sinful, and you're supposed to be a prophet, and you should know this woman is sinful, and that you should not have her touching you at all. But Jesus doesn't care. And Jesus points out to him in verses 41, in Jesus' typical way, he tells a story. He said there was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing, and when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which one of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. 
Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. This woman knew how sinful she was and how grateful she was for Jesus and what he did for her and would do for her. That he would forgive her sins as much as what they are. We too are the same. We need to be thankful in all circumstances. We all come with different stories. We all come with different backgrounds. We all come with different sin. But Jesus forgives them all. And we should be very grateful and thankful this day that we have a God that's willing to do that. Kelly, I think you're going to take us back into the Old Testament. I am. The Old Testament, if we always tell you to start with the New Testament, know who Jesus is, but then go back and look, because there are a lot of really cool stories. And it starts out primarily talking about the Israelite nation, and they were God's chosen people, and they couldn't get it right. They were put there to bless other people. They just couldn't put it right. Their dependence on God and thanksgiving of God, we see it really first demonstrated when they're free from slavery and they cross over the Red Sea. And they celebrate and they dance. But soon, their dancing, their celebration, their praise, their thanksgiving, it's forgotten. And for generations and generation and generation, they spent all this time drawing into God, praising God, and then forgetting. Drawing into God, praising and worshiping and thanking God, and then forgetting. They go through judges and prophets and then kings. David, King David, was a king after God's own heart. God referred to him as the man after his own heart. He wasn't perfect. He made mistakes, but he kept his eyes on God, and he celebrated and, had thanks and was thankful. You know, then... There were two generations of kings that turned away from God, so much so that it split the nation. So now we've got these 10 tribes to the north and two tribes to the south called Judah. And the first king of the north, he was called the most evil king that ever existed in that time. And it took two generations to finally have a king that was pointed and focused on God, and it was King Asa. And what he, it said in the Bible about King Asa, Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord. And he left that legacy to his son. His son's name was Jehoshaphat. Jeho I said that, right? So every time this week, Jehoshaphat, there we go. And he was the king of the nation of Judah. And he had heard that there were these three armies that were banding together and they were going to come make war with the nation of Judah. And so he's kind of freaking out now. He's like really scared. What am I going to do? And so he does a cool thing. He seeks the advice of God. He turns to God to find out what to do. He calls everyone together, the whole nation together, to pray and to fast. So here they are praying and fasting. What should we do? He looks back on all that God had done for the nation before. He remembers the promises of God. And so they go, turn to prayer. And then this prophet comes forward, and he prof prophesizes that they will have victory. 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15. Listen, people of Judah and Jerusalem. Listen, King Jehoshaphat. This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged by the mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And so that night, even before they went to war, even before the battle began, the people were praising. They were thanksgiving. They were being filled with thanksgiving. They were celebrating all that God was going to do. And then the next morning, 
the army of Judah, they get up and they prepare to go to battle, still praising and thanking God. So here's the cool thing that they do. They put singers ahead of the army. All right. See? <laughs> Who are worshiping and singing and praising God. Any of you singers want to sign up for that job? <laughs> A couple of foolish people back there, huh? <laughs> well, they did. They sang, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And see, in 2 Chronicles 20, 22 tells us at that very moment, the God caused the enemy armies to turn against each other. And the two armies actually killed the other army, and then they turned on each other. By the time the army of Judah arrived, everyone was dead. See, if you are a teenage boy right now, you've got to go pick up the book of Chronicles. Because there are like cool stories in there. And about God's power, and you get to see the fights and the battles, there was no one left. They hadn't picked up a weapon. They hadn't fought. They praised and celebrated their God for the victory that would come. There was so much loot that the armies had left behind that it took three days for them to gather up all of the loot and take it back to them. And they, when they were done, they went back and again they began to celebrate and they began to praise God. They began to march around fret playing instruments and giving thanks to the God. And after that, the kingdom was at peace. And the Bible tells us the story of King Jehoshaphat's life ended this way. Jehoshaphat was a good king, following in the ways of his father Asa. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. Praise and celebration, thanksgiving, before you even know the ending. That is one thing to celebrate. You look at the Old Testament, I know there's another young man who looked to God no matter what. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Jehoshaphat is a great example of uh, someone giving thanks under pressure. And uh, you could say the same thing about uh, another person named Daniel. Uh, someone we're probably all very familiar with. Uh, if you grew up in Sunday schools, you know all the stories of Daniel and the lion's den. And, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and all of that. But in this situation, uh, we're looking at the story of Daniel and the lion's den. And not so much the lions and not eating Daniel, but the circumstances that kind of brought about his winding up in the lion's den. Now, Daniel was taken captive and he was taken to Babylon uh, when he was a teenager, as I said. And eventually, Babylon was overtaken by Persia. And there was a new king in town, Darius. And he appointed a lot of people to oversee this vast kingdom of his. And Daniel ended up being one of them. As a matter of fact, Daniel, because of how well he showed himself uh, to be a man, young man of integrity and honor and commitment and loyalty, uh, was appointed as pretty much the, the guy right below the king. And that, of course, made other people jealous. And they wanted to figure out what could we do to basically knock Daniel off his little pedestal. And so they had figured out a way um, to have the king make a decree that even the king can't, couldn't change. Now, this might sound familiar because the same thing happened in Esther. If you're familiar with the story of Esther, the king made a decree and he couldn't back out of it. He couldn't renege. He had to hold true to it. And it's the same thing in Daniel. They had the king convinced to um, make it over a 30-day period that people could only pray to the king. Now, you think, what's the big deal about that? Well... Daniel was a person of integrity and great faith. And he believed in his God, and he worshipped his God. So much so that he went to prayer three times a day. 
Now that wasn't something that was called for in, in the laws of Moses. They didn't say anywhere that you needed to pray three times a day. But Daniel did. That's how committed he was. So three times a day, he would go to his room and he would throw open the windows that faced Jerusalem. And he would then pray three times a day. Sorry. He would pray three times a day and in so doing, showed his faith to other people. Showed the kind of faith that he had in his God that he worshipped. And with that, um, the people that were against him knew that this is how they could trip Daniel up. They couldn't do anything to say, oh, you can't pray to, to the God, your God, for that, because they would know that they were, you know, alienating Daniel. But they could say, for the next 30 days, you have to only pray to the king. Well, Daniel wasn't going to do that. And upon hearing the news and the word of this decree that had went out, in Daniel chapter 6, specifically in verse 10, it reads, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Daniel was not going to let a decree stand in the way of giving thanks to his God. Daniel wasn't going to stop doing what he was doing. He was not going to compromise his belief and his faith just to appease a decree. He was going to be steadfast and give thanks, knowing that it could cost him his life. But he believed that God knew that he was innocent and that God would show that innocence to the king. And that's exactly what God did. By the law, he was thrown into the lion's den. And the king was upset because he liked Daniel. But he had to stand fast to his decree. And he came rushing back the next morning and he found that Daniel was alive and well. And that God had shut the mouths of the lions. And Daniel gave praise to the king, but he also gave praise to his God, because his God had proven his innocence to the king. And it was through his faith, despite the cost, that Daniel was able to give thanks to God. And now Pastor Kelly is going to take us back into the New Testament to a very familiar scripture. Very familiar scripture. We have so much to be thankful for. And as we go into this week, I encourage you to spend some time thanking God for everything that we do have to be thankful for. And our verse for today, for this, comes from one of the most famous verses, and I'm sure you've shared it with other people. It's for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. We sit here today and we look at our Heavenly Father who loves us so much that first and foremost we were created in his image. He said, let us make man in our image. And then us, being the humans that we are, just decided to go mess it up, to listen to the advice of a serpent, to make our own will more powerful than the will of God. And our God, he just kept being there. He kept loving. He kept reaching out after mankind to bring them back. And he had this plan from the beginning, which was his son. That his son would be born to a poor carpenter man. That he would grow up a, grow up in a poor household. And then we really would know not hardly anything about him from his birth until the day that he was called into ministry, where he began to share the kingdom of heaven on earth. See, and if you know Jesus, you have
have so much to be thankful for. You have a heavenly father who gave everything for you. He gave you a gift. And if you don't know Jesus, he knows you. And he loves you. And he's calling you home today to say, I am here for you. It's easy. Just receive the gift. Receive the <coughs> gift that's been so freely offered from Jesus. Allow him to be the leader and the Lord of your life. Your best friend. And for those of you who know Jesus, he gives us a job too. Tell everyone you know. Tell people about this Savior and what he did for your life. He loves you so much. Be thankful. Let's pray. Holy God, thank you. Thank you that we woke up this morning, that the sun came up, and you gave us each another new day to praise you, to worship you, to be thankful for the life that you've given us. God, I just pray that you would often remind us of the beauty of your world, of your love, and God, I pray that you would comfort those of us who are hurting and broken, that we could give thanks in all circumstances. Because when we look to you, your love is made perfect. In Jesus' name, amen.